Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the most recently recorded astronomy podcast, where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the sponsor is Heliophysical. Nice. Acceptable. I don't know. That might need a, an apostrophe or something, but... Uh, wait, an apostrophe? apostrophe? No, no, that's not the word I'm looking a for. Hyphen? That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, hyphen. A hyphen? Heliophysics? Heliophysics does, it? does not no, have a hyphen. It is not. It's one word. Okay. It's probably even a scrabble bowl word. All right. I'm playing it next time. We are strange, top, and beauty. The Astro Quirks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Jim Cooney, and Zoe Landsman, coming to you from the Walkabout Studios at the University of Central Florida. Who? Who? <laughs> Who's that person sitting next to you? Charm Astro Quirk Addie Dove is on a road trip, and we'll be back for our next episode. Zoe, thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Uh, Jim. Yeah. Game of Thrones or Westworld? Uh, Have you heard of either of those? This is a tough one because of those two series, both of which seem interesting to me. I've seen one total episode of both those series. So it's it was. Does Game that mean no, no, no one? If one season, seen, oh. one season. I oh. seen the first season of Game of Thrones, and I didn't see anything else. It was good. You've seen zero of Westworld. I've seen zero of Westworld because I lack access to HBO. Ah, uh-huh. okay. but I've heard good things about it. So, I'm go- but I'm going for Game of Thrones because I saw it. Although I was very upset when Boromir died at the end of season. Of season Spoiler one. Alert. Spoiler, Spoiler alert. alert. Well, we've had we're seven seasons down. <laughs> yeah. I think if you, you don't know that by now. I think that is the statute of limitations for season for TV spoilers. Yeah. After seven seasons, you can say what happened. Also, he's Sean Bean, so you can just assume anything <laughs> yeah. he's in, he's going to die. Oh, is that yeah. a thing that Sean Bean does? Yes, yeah, he dies. He dies in everything. Yeah, uh, Zoe, infrared or ultraviolet? Infrared. How did I know Ooh, you were going to say that? <laughs> yeah, it was quick. Did yeah. you see how I noticed that, how different that was from uh, Addie's normal choice of? Uh, oh, oh yeah, Addie's about torment, it for tormented seven minutes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, this was an easy one for me. Because? Uh, well, because I study the surfaces of asteroids, and the infrared wavelengths are the most diagnostic region to study the surfaces of asteroids if you're interested in what minerals they're made out of. What about if you're interested in what their ultraviolet spectrum looks like? Well, then the uh, infrared is not going to help that could be, <laughs> Then the ultraviolet might be more, yeah. Uh, have you? Are there ultraviolet spectra? There are. I'm sure Alan Stern, in fact, probably has a bunch of papers about ultraviolet spectra of asteroids. Cause so, actually, your uh, former student and maybe sometimes astroquark, Tracy Becker, uh, is currently <laughs> working... Original top. She yeah. Was, yeah, original top cork. Tracy Becker uh, is studying that uh, now at the Southwest Research Institute. Ultraviolet, ultraviolet spectra. So these are short wavelength. So you, it, and we look at reflected light from stuff, and uh, it tells us something sometimes about the composition. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of these people that likes to look at spectra from things that are gases because they. They're like super clear what you're looking at. There are these nice clear signatures like, ah, it's hydrogen. It's iron ionized three times or whatever. Right. And the, the spectra from asteroids, I'm sorry, Zoe, they're kind of like, well, it's kind of got a wiggle and then it kind of goes up a little bit more than this other thing goes <laughs> up over here. You know, it gives you a bit more flexibility to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> the story. <laughs> Freedom for the theorist. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm just giving you a hard time. Uh, we are joined today by longtime listener, first-time podcaster, Adam LeMay, teacher in residence at the physics department at UCF. Adam, welcome to Walk About the Galaxy. Thanks for having me. It's hey. great, great to have you here. Uh, we've been meaning to get you on the show for a while. Uh, besides listening to Walk About, what is your second most favorite pastime? Uh I, I like trying to figure out how to take particle physics data and turn that into high school activities. So that sounds impossible. That sounds <laughs> very challenging. <laughs> awesome. Even the first part of that sounds impossible. <laughs> take particle physics data. Like, even that I can't I do. And then the second part was yeah. was to make Translate it. Translate it to high school somehow. And then that's also impossible. Translate anything <laughs> to high school it also strikes me as impossible. So, cool. Uh, have you done, have you had su- success in that yeah. yet? Yeah. We, uh, uh, I and some colleagues of mine with the Corknet, um, program, uh, the Corknet program. How are we not part of that? Of that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's, uh, it's housed at, or based at Fermi lab. Um, and it's the U.S.'s particle physics outreach group. And, um, yeah, we do things like take event displays from particle detectors and, uh, figure out a way to present them to students so that we look at, um, 
how energy and momentum are conserved and particle interactions and decays so that instead of just doing billiard ball problems in physics one, we can do uh, uh, top quark decays. What? That's crazy. Wow. Nice. Yeah. I've never done any of that myself. Right on. It's in, I mean, in high school or afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In any form or, or other. Uh, let's see. Other space news. There's a, a dust storm on Mars that's been going all summer that's uh, made it so that we can't communicate. We haven't been able to communicate with the Opportunity rover. Um, it's kind of a bummer because Mars at opposition, everybody wants to take a look at Mars. I know. And all the images are like blurry. Right. It just Because of the dust storm. Right. You can't see the nice clear features and all the canals that the Martians built. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's been um, about three months almost since we last heard from the Opportunity rover, uh, which has been up Aww. on Mars for 14 years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, our trivia will be coming back to the Opportunity rover Ooh. a little bit later in the show. So the uh, but the storm seems to be dissipating, and it's powers from solar panels, and so there's hope that uh, it will come back from its sort of power fault mode and uh, communicate once again. Um, let's Does it see. have windshield wipers on the solar panels? You know, it it could. It could have some kind of, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, but Aww. yeah, solar panel wipers. So it, it accumulates dust and then the dust in the past, they've seen it like get blown off, right? Yeah, yeah. There was, a, wasn't there a dust devil at one point that cleared a bunch of dust off of one of these rovers? The, I know that. That's ridiculously lucky. Well, yeah. <laughs> I know that we've seen dust devils on Mars, like there are some amazing movies that yeah. the rovers have taken yeah. of dust devils going by that just kind of like look so terrestrial, right? Looks like something really you'd see in Arizona. Blowing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, looks so familiar. It's really right, weird. Right, yeah. And um, and there are, I've seen pictures of sort of the dust coverage on the panels. It takes pictures of its own panels and it gets dusty and then it's clear. It's dusty and it's clear. Uh, so hopefully they'll be clear enough for the thing to to come alive again. Um, they're cranking up their efforts to communicate with it these days. Um, another space malfunction item in the news is about the ISS. Did you read about this? I, I did. Know. Yeah. Are you going to? going to tell us about it? No. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the what I had read is that there was a leak in the ISS. Oh, oh my snap. goodness. Uh, and it was at least temporarily fixed by one of the astronauts placing his finger over the <laughs> hole. <laughs> so it's in this it's in a Soyuz capsule, right? That's docked to the ISS. Oh, uh, yes, it was some right. Yeah, it had it, I'm not sure if the leak was in Soyuz or the ISS. I guess it was in Soyuz. That's terrible. Isn't the Soyuz like the only way to get people on and off of the uh, currently the ISS? This one it's is just a leaky bucket. Somebody ought to do something about it. <laughs> yeah. So this one is a cargo Soyuz that's docked there temporarily, and I think they have two that are permanently docked. That because each one carries three, and the the crew complement of the ISS is six people. Mm -hmm. So they've got two that are like permanently docked up there that are ready to if they have to evacuate pop down in that. Oh. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what's the big deal? If you get in it and you need to go home with that, you just put your thumb <laughs> yeah, over the hole, yeah. right? <laughs> Chew some gum, slap it on there. There you're you go. good to go. You're good to go. And the thing is, actually, you probably would be fine if you're just coming, you know, going down, if you're a few hours trip to get from ISS back down, uh, some gum probably would do the trick. I guess. I, I, I worry, <laughs> like, the, the, the stress of re-entry would concern me. If, oh, I, if I thought well, there was a crack I don't think it, or oh, something. I don't know what well, the... Well, that's the issue is like what, what, what kind of leak is right, it, right? Right, So this is a hole that's two millimeters across, which is kind of big <laughs> yeah. um, what is that, like as a, far as these things go. A rivet fell out or something? Uh, they, they have not said what they think the source of the leak is. At least I couldn't find any information about it. So yeah. but it conceivably could be a micrometeoroid impact. Right. Um, uh, it's too small a hole to be a BB, probably. That would really do <laughs> some serious damage at, at orbital velocities. Um, but one of the things, you know, talking about putting the thumb over it, like if it were in the movies and the person put his thumb over it, he would be turned to jello and sucked out of that <laughs> hole. Sure, sure. Right? Right. Which just said, and there's been a lot of movies like that. It drives me nuts. The, uh, in total recall, 
the original Total Recall with Schwarzenegger. Yes. Do you remember his Fine eyes film. like popping oh, out, great. Yeah. popping yeah. out on stalks <laughs> yeah. at the yes. end of his optic yeah. nerves? Yeah, yeah. Uh, then he, of course, are, he was fine afterwards. <laughs> so, right. Then he just like, oh, let me just pop that back in. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's how that works. Um, and then in one of the Aliens movies, I guess the fourth or something, I don't know. There are too many to keep track of now, but the one with Winona Ryder. Some, some, something gets, something gets smushed out of a hole that's just a, like an inch or two across. Right. And it's like atmospheric pressure is 15 pounds per square inch. So uh, 15 pounds isn't enough to turn me to. Jello. No. <laughs> no, you're a tough guy. <laughs> I'm, yeah, not decaying <laughs> yet. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Planetary side of things. We've got New Horizons took its first picture of whatever ridiculous name. Did they give a name to that thing yet? They did give a name to it, but I don't remember the official name. Okay. This is an object that it's pr provisional name was something like 2014 MU 99 or 69 it or something like that. It was 69, yep. <laughs> MU 69. That was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is the Kuiper Belt object that is the next destination for the New Horizons spacecraft. And it's flying by it on January 1st of 2019. So it's just around the corner. Right. And it just took its first picture from a distance of 100 million miles, which is about the distance from the Earth to the sun. So that's how far away it is, and it will be there in a couple months. Right. So those pictures are not impressive, of course. They're uh, it's, it's a pixel a or something dot. like that. Yeah. 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 Um, the opposite of impressive, right, whatever that right. is. I mean, it's impressive that it gets a picture of it, that you can see it, I guess. But uh, They know they're headed towards something. Yes, yes. <laughs> They've at least found it in their, right. in their screens or yep. whatever, yeah. Um, and, of course, it's going to go zipping by this thing. I mean, it's not the kind of encounter like we've got with other planetary missions, right? Right. I mean, this was a, this was like a uh, an opportunity, you know, like a, a, a uh, grabbing a op random opportunity to fly by something, but it wasn't – the mission wasn't planned around getting to this thing. And so – Well, and, but even if it had been, there's nothing they can do. Right. Like, well, I mean, it, I guess if the whole mission were planned to go to this one thing, you might be able to figure some kind of orbit out that would at least – decrease the the relative speeds of the two yeah, things but this one not by much yeah yeah oh. because i mean it's going around and around the earth and you're having to get 40 times further from around and around the sun I mean, <laughs> we do, is it a heliocentric things. or a geocentric <laughs> universe which way do, which way do things flat. work yeah um but it's going around the sun and the spacecraft has to basically be going essentially straight away from the sun right. unless you want it to take a hundred years to, right, to right, get there right um so, yeah, it's, it's going to go zipping by this thing. And how big is it? Do you remember? It's tiny. Well, um, let me think about that and definitely not look at the Wikipedia page for it. Okay. <laughs> it is um, – <laughs> well, Wikipedia reports the dimensions of this object as 20 – Plus or minus 18 kilometers. What? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I suppose it could, if it's if it's perfectly reflective, like if it's an alien mirror, maybe it's only two kilometers across or yeah, something. Yeah, it seems... Nice, yes. Um, but it's also believed it might, yeah, also believed it might be a contact uh, binary or a true binary object that we actually got stellar occultations of it. So we've sort of seen its shadow on the Earth from some distant star, uh, as opposed to all the nearby stars. <laughs> and uh, it looks – has a funny shape, like it might be two objects. So that'll be cool. And then there's another uh, first sighting of a mission approaching an object. Do you know what that is? Looking around. No. Fellow – Addy knows. Addy knows. You're in Addy's chair. Damn it, Zoe. <laughs> Zoe knows. I. I'll try to be the Zoe best Addy I can be this time. Uh, I believe you're referring to the Osiris Rex mission Ooh, uh, on its approach to the asteroid Bennu. Yes. So it's taken its first picture of its target, even though it's much much closer than New Horizons. It's only a million miles away, but it gets getting there at about the same time. Because it's approaching it much more slowly, because it is going to hang around at that guy for a while, right? Yep. Yeah. But Bennu has the Bennu is a what a near Earth asteroid, so it has a uh, a yep. uh, trajectory that takes it somewhere near the Earth at some point, right? So in, in both, the inner solar system, and these in that case, everything is basically going around the sun on pretty much the same right path. This is now like uh, the last episode that I just saw of, or a recent episode of some show where the opening credit was 45 minutes into the hour-long show. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. 
It's like there's this whole weird theme where, like, this is a really weird show. And then, like, 40 minutes in, we see the title of the show. <laughs> and so, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the Solar Cycle. Solar cycles, uh, sure, months are fine for bills and paychecks, and seasons and years are great for vacations and school and birthdays, but don't you feel that you're missing an astronomical time scale to measure the truly important landmarks in your life? The sun is happy to provide you with its 11-year solar cycle to measure your life out in eighths or ninths or tenths if you like leading a healthy lifestyle and have a bit of luck. You can drink at the end of your second solar cycle, have a midlife crisis, and drink some more at the end of your fourth, and join the AARP at the end of your fifth. So start celebrating the major milestones of your life with the rise and fall of solar sunspots, high-energy photon flux, and radio emissions from the solar corona. The 11-year solar cycle, the other astronomical clock. Cool. Nice. Solar cycles are nominally 11 years. Right. And, but not actually exactly so. There's a significant variability. Right. And and so this is a thing. So obviously in the modern age, we easily can track this uh, because we can see the surface of the sun using telescopes and we can count uh, sunspots and whatnot. Is this a pattern that was known to more ancient civilizations? Well, the first sort of accurate record keeping began in the middle of the 18th century where they started tracking it. The first observation, as far as I'm aware, of sunspots was Galileo. Right. Uh, shortly before he blinded himself by looking at the sun <laughs> through a telescope. So you pretty uh, much need a telescope. <laughs> and that was in the early 17th century. Um, and I don't think there was sort of systematic tracking. And there was a, a time when the cycle wasn't very obvious called the Maunder Minimum. Right. right. Uh, and that was in that time frame, basically. Uh, isn't that right? In the 17th century. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah this led it, or coincided with something called the Little Ice Age, where temperatures were significantly cooler uh, at least in Europe um, at that time. Um, but, yeah, the, apparently the duration can be anywhere from like 8 to 14 years. Uh, since that record keeping began 250-some years ago, I would say 1750 to the present, they've been numbered. And so we're just finishing up solar cycle number 24. Around about now, so this we're, is nice. This is like we were talking about last last uh, episode, where this is the sun is is frustratingly complicated. I don't like that it's not that it's the solar cycle is not regular. That pisses me off. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. I uh, feel like it's well, like maybe, weather. Maybe, I mean, weather isn't very predictable. No, but it, it's bigger than weather. Like we weather isn't very predictable, but uh, climate is. What? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> right. I mean, like. I know that it's going to get warm in the summer and it's going to get cool in the winter and it does so very regularly for very simple reasons, right? Uh, Once a year, but then there are things like the biennial oscillation in El Nino that is sort of every couple of years, but not exactly. And sometimes it's bigger than others and sometimes you skip one. Yeah. That's climatey. The Bermuda High moves around. That's a thing, right? The Bermuda High? It's a high pressure system. I don't know the, about it. I think that drives, well, it's one of the things that drives... Where Atlantic where, hurricanes go. Yeah. It deflects them or not, or depending not. if it's there. Yeah. yeah. Or where it is. Okay. Something yeah. like that. Yes. I'm just making All things right. up. I just, I just want things to be simpler. It's a big giant ball of hydrogen. It should just, it should just, behave, it itself. Just behave itself nicely. <laughs> right. I'm angry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so in, in some, maybe this will make you feel better. So the solar cycle is this variation in sunspots and the number of sunspots that appear each solar cycle is very different from cycle to cycle. Uh, the one that we're just finishing, solar cycle 24, is on track to be the lowest number of sunspots in a solar cycle since we've been recording them, wow. interestingly enough. Hmm. Um, but to make you feel better about sort of predictability and repeatability, the total amount of energy coming from the sun varies by less than 1% All right. over the course of these cycles. So it's like, oh, solar cycle and everything, but it's like, yeah, there's yeah. some variations going on, <laughs> right. but in some sense, they're kind of in the noise, right? Okay. Which okay. is why... They are sponsoring this show, so get the word out. <laughs> people, get out of the noise. People, yeah. people are aware of the years and are in the months, and you know that's obvious. The solar cycle, not so obvious. Yeah. All right, thanks, um, solar cycle. Cool. Yeah, uh, we're even talking about some astrophysical stuff. But Adam, you've been listening to the podcast uh, as probably some sort of anthropological investigation. <laughs> that was my other master's degree. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it, have you accumulated any, um, complaints, caught us in mistakes, 
questions. Well, there, uh, there are some <laughs> unresolved issues that I'd like to. Well, thanks. It's been great show. having you on the show. <laughs> thanks very much for joining. Unresolved. Us. Uh, <laughs> in the uh, in the episode leading up to the eclipse, uh, Josh, you mentioned uh, something that you purchased on Amazon called a pilot's friend. Yes, and you are looking forward. To the prospect of using it, and the other uh, hosts oh, here yes. uh, were very skeptical. So, how did that turn out? Well, so this. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if I we, remember that. If now. we go, we go way back to the summer <laughs> of 2017, and there were uh, lots of anticipation about uh, the solar eclipse, and we were making a road trip, and there was all this anticipation about the unbelievable traffic jams and there were these maps of where across the entire country where all the horrible traffic jams were going to be and it was the first day of class i had to be back immediately after <laughs> and so like anxious about these sort of nightmarish visions of being stuck on i-95 for hours and hours and hours on end and so there are these things and uh <laughs> There are these things that allow oneself to avoid having to make a pit stop on the side of the road. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, I will say that they work great. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. Been well, well tested, huh? Uh, t tested, I'll say. <laughs> Utilized. With, without uh, tragic incident or uh, complications. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, no problems. What could go wrong? <laughs> right, no, they should, uh, yeah, they should maybe. sponsor an episode of Walk About the Galaxy. I should, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out reach to them. Reach out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jim, fictional or fictitious? Oh, Ooh. did he never answer that one, or is that just one of your own? Did you pose that? I'm not caught up in the last couple episodes. I don't know. Uh, I love them both. Fic uh, fictitious. I think I like that word better. Fictitious. Okay. Or fictitious. Fictional. I don't. Is there a difference in the meaning or? I, or I just feel like there is. Fictitious. Fiction. Fictional. Fictitious sounds more like you're trying to make something, like you're trying to deceive somebody. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hmm. They have different All right. connotations. Do you have one for Zoe? Uh, so I had one for Addy and Zoe. I don't know you well enough to know if this will. Map, but we'll see. Um, BSG, I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, Battlestar Galactica reboot or Firefly? Oh. Oh, oh no. That's There's a right answer. answer. This is a... Uh, There's a loaded question. <laughs> this is this is uh, dangerous territory here. Uh, it's dangerous territory means she wants to say BSG. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> she, BSG. You <laughs> traitor. <laughs> I'm so wrong. Very sorry. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I don't, I don't mean to hijack your question, <laughs> but I'm doing it. Uh, BSG Reboot, great. Wonderful show. Yeah, Zoe and I watched it together. Uh, we loved it. It was great. Uh, but it does not even hold a candle to Firefly, of course. Gosh. Well, it's a little bit unfair because They're Firefly was just 13 episodes. Yeah. And Battlestar Galactica was five seasons, I think, of yeah. 20 episodes or something. I think so, that makes its awesomeness density greater for Firefly, if they're at all comparable. Could, yeah. But it also I gives it less chance to have become terrible. Yeah. Which, yeah. that's true. I would argue kind of happened to BSG. Yeah, the yeah, last the very season end, went yeah. off the rails. Yeah. I yeah. Just, uh, also, I got tired of, you know, the opening credits for Battlestar Galactica reboot for those that don't remember, don't oh, yeah. see it, or I'm... maybe don't care. It's like, oh, the Cylons, they have they a plan. They have a plan. They don't what? have a plan. They did they not have, have a plan. plan. <laughs> no plan whatsoever. That, that <laughs> infuriates all of us. Yeah. That, yeah, so, okay. All right. So, all right. Josh, one for you. Sorry. <gasps> Um, I was about to. I thought I had already been nailed with having to admit <laughs> that I peed in my car. <laughs> uh, original BSG, Star Trek Enterprise, or Armageddon? Star Trek Enterprise. Okay, because those three are my least favorite sci-fis of all, of all time. time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Armageddon, forget about it. I cannot, <laughs> cannot even consider but Bruce it. Bruce Willis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I only have, I've got several like one degree of separations acting wise with Armageddon. And I like Billy Bob too. Yeah. Uh, he's yeah. great. And I like Ben Affleck. And I love, I just discovered on one of the Armageddon like commentary tracks or something that's out there. Ben Affleck is like, says, explain to me to the director, Michael Bay, why it is it's easier to train uh, people who can drill how to be an astronaut <laughs> than it is to train astronauts how to drill. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, and the director just like F you. And, <laughs> um, and what was it? Original BSG. 
Yeah, it's just there. And like Star Trek Enterprise overall, because I'll grant you major issues there, but I thought there were some parts of it that were very good. Okay. So that's why it has enough episodes. There's more of it. And so it was sort of the converse of the BSG Firefly thing. Right there's enough of that where there's enough good there that it wins. I, I may remain unswayed, but I'll really? accept that. What about the episode where uh, it's like the Memento episode where I Captain get, Archer and, yeah. forgets his whole life every day. Every day he wakes up and and um, the Vulcan, what's her name? Oh, uh, come on, guys. It sucked. It sucked so we didn't it. watch it. I have not watched any of those three things. Uh, I'm having a mind blank, but anyway, and, and I know that half my listeners, or at least to my, to my daughter, is uh, screaming. Yeah, she uh, has to tell him how he got to this point in his life and what's going on every morning. That's a really good episode. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I wasn't some, able to get out of this first season, and I tried. Oh, a few really? Times. Yeah. Oh. Well, there were some good episodes. I'll power through it. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> uh. Our main science topics, which we've now frittered, frittered, we've been doing a lot of frittering, um, are astrophysical. So uh, there were some observations of uh, uh, and study of a distant galaxy and therefore a galaxy very early in the universe and its rapid, uh, very high star formation rate. So we'll talk about that. But before we do, because it's gone on so long, I want to throw out the trivia because we're right. still sort of in the planetary realm and the trivia is planetary. Okay, so we'll throw that out there. Then we'll talk about this uh, galaxies and bottom quarks and uh, go from there. So the trivia, we mentioned uh, that we're hoping to hear from the Opportunity rover soon, now that this big dust storm is waning. Uh, Opportunity landed on Mars uh, with a twin rover spirit in 2004. It's been there 14 years. Its original mission duration was just supposed to be 90 days. Uh, Spirit got stuck in 2009. It was last heard from in 2010. Uh, but opportunity, we've had contact as recently as this summer. The trivia question is simple. What is the total distance traveled by the opportunity rover on Mars? Answers will be accepted in any units. Ooh. Except qubits. Uh, but not, not at one. the moment. In uh, units of how far to, Opportunity you, has roved. Oh, you may have outfoxed. <laughs> you may have outfoxed the walkabout trivia master. Yeah. So think about that, and uh, we'll come back to that after you explain to us. Star, star formation. And, uh, so uh, the main idea behind this is it's cool in modern astrophysics because we can see galaxies that are very, very far away, which means... Uh, very early in the solar Very universe. early in the age of the universe. So here we're talking about a galaxy that's that's uh, something like 13 billion light years away. So uh, arose when the galaxy was very young. Uh, thus, when the universe was very young. Excuse me, is that I say galaxy? Yeah, I mean when the universe was very young. So I mean, I, when we're studying our galaxy or nearby galaxies, we're seeing galaxies as they are when they're billions, tens of billions of years old. If I want to see what they're like when they're first born. We have to go back and use these big, huge, giant, powerful telescopes to see what the universe was like then. Right. And this this ALMA telescope has been a real boon for that in the last several years yes. for, for seeing these different things. This is the Atacama Large Millimeter something or other. Array, maybe. Array. Um, absolutely. And that, that's another, by the way, another really important thing that the James Webb is supposed to do as the next generation space telescope. It's It sees a lot in... Uh, in wavelengths, it should be able to see these really early uh, galaxies as well. So, um, basically, the idea is, and if you look in our galaxy today, there is new baby stars being born, but but not at a very great rate. You baby. know, a few stars every Aww, year or something like that. Oh, I know, stars. very cute, cute baby stars. And most of the stars that are formed are in the disk of the galaxy. They're in you know the occasional big blob of gas and dust that you find these nebulae out there. Uh, but if you look at very early galaxies, it's a lot of times a lot different. The, the rate at which stars are being born is thousands of times greater than the rate at which stars are being born now. And that's what they saw in this in this very young galaxy, a, a, a starburst galaxy. These call these things where there's lots and lots of star f forming regions, but concentrated at the center of the galaxy so, rather than in the outer parts. So what is it that tells you that you're seeing star formation happening versus just stars shining, right? You, you see stars when they're you, you are shining. That's a star. <laughs> sure. And when it's not a star, you don't see it. So what is it that right. tells you you're seeing a lot of star formation happening? Because we're not actually like 
I looked now and I counted 50 million stars. No. And then I looked the next day and there were 52 million stars. <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. Um, a lot of it is you're looking at stars that so very big stars die very, very quickly, right? So the very largest stars in the, uh, uh, in the spectrum of size of stars, if you're 10 times the mass of the sun or 20 or 50 times the mass of the sun, you die very, very quickly in a matter of a few million or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years. So when you see a lot of those, you know that there's a lot of star birth going on. Cause if you're looking at an old, galaxy, you're not going to see very many of these very big stars because they so, die off very so, quickly. So, if you see giant stars, by definition, you're looking at baby stars. Right. And so, right. if you see a bunch of giant stars, you're seeing a bunch of babies. And right. so, therefore, there were just a bunch of stars born. Right. Right. Exactly. And so, yeah, in, the, in these early, really early galaxies, we're seeing a huge bursts of star formation in the very central parts of the galaxy, which is kind of what we'd expect. I think there were a few interesting uh, twists that they found with this galaxy, like we kind of expected these early galaxies to be very disordered things, all right? In the, in the late universe, all of, uh, most of our mature galaxies are these spiral galaxies that have the very well-defined spiral arms that, or, or at least yeah. a, a disk with but spiral arms. things supposed like- to get more disordered as time goes on instead of – more ordered, wouldn't I? Wouldn't we expect things to start off nice and ordered and uh, get messy? As it, evolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> take that laws of thermodynamics. Yeah. <laughs> um, so sure, on, on uh, it, in toto, yes. If you uh, calculate the total entropy of the universe, it's always going to be increasing. But uh, obviously, like like uh, she says, for I mean, in evolution, things get. More ordered in some sense, in the overall sense, they get less ordered. But but my room gets less ordered. That it does. With time. That it does. But if you take- and the galaxy is not a living thing. No. No. But if you take, you know, it's it's much like a solar system, right? It starts out as this big kind of disordered, in some sense, cloud of gas and dust. And what happens is it collapses. You get this cool, you know, you get a, a things concentrate at the center and you it flattens out into a disk. Uh, right. So same. this thing got ordered quickly. Right, right. That's the idea. Things, things are, yeah. Uh, that, that these, that there is a lot of, there's a distinct spiral to this galaxy and it's more ordered than we expected. Right. So, so it's popping stars out at about a thousand times the rate that the Milky Way is. Right. But isn't it like you said that's kind of what you expect because the way we get to our current nice galaxy is by having had lots and lots and lots of these big stars popping off to produce because when when the star when popping off popping off <laughs> does that Technical have term. Uh, yeah. do i need to look up urban dictionary did, <laughs> did i just say something that shouldn't be repeated or something i don't even know anymore um but uh when the stars explode the the those stars in their lifetime make heavy elements things right. that we like to use to live like right. Carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and iron and phosphorus and we could go on. <laughs> There's a hundred or so things we could, we could go on and list. But yeah, manganese, thank you, Adam. Uh, and so they make those things which weren't there before stars. Right. Because the Big Bang was useless for that. Yeah. And it pops them out back into the galaxy, which then can be incorporated in the next generation of stars and the planets that form around them. Mm-hmm. So we knew those things had to have happened. For sure. And then, uh, but what about the rate? I mean, there's something that's connected with the deaths of those stars with triggering what happens next. I'm not sure what you're getting at exactly, but... Uh... I'm going to leave it a mystery. Okay. No, just that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to leave it a mystery. <laughs> why, does, why does a cloud of gas collapse and form a star to begin with there's been some perturbation yeah it's got it's denser right and so it wants to fall in on itself so what perturbs it Zoe. other other uh other things exploding yeah nearby yeah you get some of these big stars popping off yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that and i mean isn't that what we think happened with our uh own st- Solar system, Absolutely. right? There's some evidence that a nearby supernova were involved yeah. uh, from the presence of uh, certain radioactive elements in our asteroids, right, yeah. Zoe? Asteroid sounds, girl? Sounds right to me. Could you take an infrared spectrum and see evidence of uh, the remnants of a supernova four and a half billion years ago? Um, no. I personally can't. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the infrared or the ultraviolet, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, 
So, so yeah. So basically, this this star formation begets further star formation. Uh, so you have kind of like a self, you know, much like an, a a nuclear explosion. Uh, when these big stars blow up, they could trigger more star formation around them, and then that can trigger more star. Formation. So this ha- this happens quite quickly. In effect, something like a hundred million years. All of this is going to be done, and all of this gas and dust that exists in the kind of real central regions of this very young galaxy will be used up, either either in stars or blown out, you know, into the. the so then, what becomes of that galaxy? So then it, then it starts to evolve and becomes more like our galaxy, where there'll still be some star formation, but much more slow, you know, slow stuff in the outer parts and the in the uh, in the disk. And the central parts will start to contain just older stars. And that's exactly what we see in our, in the halo of our galaxy, in the central parts of our galaxy. There's not a lot of star formation because all the stars and all the dust and, and gas is gone and we just have old stars there. But is that because over time, just by chance or for some non chance reason, the new stars that are being made are not these giant, massive, short lived stars, but they tend to be more like the sun where it's going to stick around for, a billion or billions of years instead of popping off after 50 million years. <laughs> no, no. I'm going to keep saying popping off. Is, <laughs> if people laugh at something I say, I will repeat it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is clear. This is empirical pop evidence. Off. To Hashtag that. pop off, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that in general in stars form that it's always going to be roughly the same fraction of big stars versus small stars, but eventually you're just going to run out of the material to make stars. And so once I run through, I mean, these early galaxies have – quite dense regions of gas and dust in their central parts that begets star formation. You go through the process and make a whole bunch of things. And eventually you run out of the gas and dust. And now yeah. I'm you, done. you said begets twice now. Oh, episode. good word. It's very biblical. It <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all about origins and <laughs> Genesis and things like that. Uh, so you mentioned you run out of stuff, but I was just saying how, like, when the stars explode, it's pushing that stuff out there to make new stars. What's the kind of right? But every how, how, right, every time you, you make lose? a star, how yeah, much? I mean, it, when you when when these big stars explode and throw their stuff back out, they're not throwing all their stuff back right. out. They're just throwing some fraction of their stuff. Plus, the smaller the star, the smaller the fraction of their stuff that they'll throw back recycled. out. Right? right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, small stars keep most of their stuff. They do throw off some of their outer layers when they kind of run out of steam. Right. Very small stars never run out of steam really, in, yeah. our, in the age of the universe yet. And so they, they kind of hold all their stuff. So every kind of generation of stars that you make is going to be less and less material for the next generation of stars to right. form from. Like there are stars in our galaxy that have that basically have been around since the Milky Way formed. Yeah, right? absolutely. Star, yeah. Stars that have, you know, w- you know two-tenths of a solar mass, 0.2 times the mass of the sun or something like that. They have lifetimes that are a couple hundred billion years, which is far greater what? than the age of the universe. And so they're just going to keep burning and burning and burning. Yeah. Wow. I mean, not Those forever, are, but. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's a long time. It seems a little bit unfair. It's like, who do they think they are? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, the stuff that they don't throw off ends up in these embers that we've spent a lot of time talking about. And what kind of ember it is depends on what the star is. So for our, for the sun, how much of the sun's stuff is going to get uh, recycled back into the Milky Way? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't. I don't have a good number off the top of my head, but I, I want to say something on the order of half of it gets thrown back out, and half of it will end up as the okay. white dwarf that is the the yeah. ember of our star. Yeah, I, I could be off on that by a factor of a couple, but it's but not, not a factor of ten. No, right? yeah. And so, in the bigger stars, it's a black hole that's left in the in- right. inside. Right. Or and for them, star. it's a bigger fraction of the thing. I mean, the black hole, if you have a 10 solar mass star to begin with, you might only end up with 10% of that as the black hole and throw off 90%, 90% or something of the material. Yeah. But the smaller the star, the less stuff you're going to throw off. Hmm. Okay. Fascinating. Stellar physics, Ste- stellar, stellar astrophysics for the day. Stellar pop off. <laughs> Still laughing. Okay, let's go back to the trivia. Then. All right. Okay. So your question was, how far has the Curiosity rover driven in its 14 years on Mars? Okay. I'm gonna let's start. We'll start with uh, we'll start, start with, with the, Jim. What about the guest? The guest has the privilege of going last. Oh. Oh, so he can, so he nice. can like, like on Wheel of Fortune, so he, so he can, can use my answers to right. uh, two hundred right. and a one. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> um. We'll go with, so how far has Opportunity roved? That's correct. In any units. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say 10 to the minus 14 light years. 
what is that? That's a tenth of a kilometer or something? How many? There's, isn't it, isn't <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. I'll change my answer. How about, I think it's probably roamed 3.2 kilometers. 3.2 kilometers. Zoe, your answer in kilometers, please. <laughs> five Three point two five point five kilometers. Ooh. Ooh. Well, it is beauty who wins the Woo! day. Yeah. But you are both, all three, actually, Wait. way off. <laughs> 45. 45. Point wow. one six wow. okay. kilometers. It's been there 14 I guess, yeah. years. Yeah. so slow, though. Yeah. 20, so two miles a year. Yeah. Uh, roughly. That's pretty good. It's yeah. That's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, Spirit, it's a twin rover, which uh, lasted for five years before it got stuck, traveled uh, 4.8 miles. So on average. But if you recall, at one point, Opportunity sort of done its main thing. And then they're like, okay, we're going to send it on this giant trek. Yeah. And yeah. so for a long time, it was just like marching, marching, marching towards this other crater. Mm. Um, uh, so it did a long. Lots of times these orders like go here and it's like hangs out for a month sniffing around, you know, poking at rocks and taking pictures and samples and stuff. Right. And they did that for years with opportunity, but then they sent it on this long cross country trek. Okay. Uh, so that's where it probably picked up most of its miles. Uh, how about other Mars rovers? You're, there are other, there's another rover on Mars currently active that is named. Curiosity. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. I, I knew that. I was going to let you get it. Oh, yes. Yeah, I appreciate stop that. being so deferential there. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, how marriage works. It works yeah. better if you just. <laughs> I did. I mean, I did just ruin our marriage by choosing Battlestar over. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. There's going to be some couch sleeping tonight. <laughs> uh, Curiosity rover's been on Mars since 2012. Any guesses on how far it has traveled in its six years? So this is a bigger rover. It is a bigger is. rover. Bigger tires. Bigger wheels, anyway. Bigger wheels. I wouldn't really describe them as tires. Right. Metal metal sort of (laughs) dust-gripping thingies. Uh, Adam, you want to go first on this one? The last one was uh, 45 kilometers. It worked out to two miles a year for opportunity. Maybe 10 kilometers? Uh, You're giving this too much thought, everybody. 20 kilometers. Five kilometers. Jim wins. 18.6. Ooh. Uh, yeah, because I know they've sent that thing on a few long yeah, trips yeah. to, That's you true. know, we can see some, this cool thing in the distance. Let's yeah. go check this out. Yeah. So, it is, uh, by the way, operating just fine in spite of this dust storm. Yeah. Why is that? Oh. Does it have a, uh, a d- does it not use solar panels? Does that it have a r- r- radioisotope yeah, uh, right. thing? Yeah. It does not have solar panels. Its power is from uh, uh, radioisotope. Thermoelectric generator, so it uses the heat. A lot of people think, oh, it's a nuclear reactor. It's not a nuclear no. reactor, right? These things use the heat. It's it's something that's radioactive and therefore hot. And if you have a hot piece of metal of one type connected to another metal of another type, you just get a – it's like a battery. Right. Like you get a potential – Is that a Peltier thing? Uh, is that a tennis player? <laughs> <laughs> No, don't they make uh, that's a, that's a, that's a brand, brand of bottled know. water? Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah, there yes. <laughs> Sparkling Peltier. <laughs> What's a Peltier thing? Uh, it's uh, yeah. I, I you I, don't know either. You're just making I, I've random never noises. Held up. One in my hand, but I I've seen that you can get them for your um uh to keep your computer processor cool if you're into like modding things like that instead of a big aluminum heat sink you can put this peltier thing in there um i don't know about that but this has plutonium in it so i don't think you can get it for your laptop (laughs) so you can apply a voltage and you get a temperature differential but i think it also works backwards oh yes i am sure yeah i yeah and i i'm embarrassed to admit that i'm unfamiliar with the terminology but i imagine it's the same basic physics going on i learned about it online when uh looking at somebody's plans that they made a a beer cooler mug an active one with one of these things on the bottom of it you do a lot more fun physics than we do (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. it's like beer coolers and reverse uh radioisotope thermoelectric generators and (laughs) cloud particle physics in the high school classroom that's great that's amazing Awesome. Uh, what about the next rover? <clears throat> What's the next rover? Mars 2020. Mars 2020? Dude. Yeah. I don't think it has a name yet. Though, Is that, that's also pretty large, yeah? It's basically the same kind of frame as the Curiosity rover. Right. I hope they give it a name that's a little bit less generic than like Opportunity and Curiosity and, I mean, something. Steve. Wally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adam, maybe. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, so it's scheduled for launch in 2020 and guess what it's going to bring with it. This is awesome. 
I only learned about this today. I don't know. I That's a tech imagine. demo, a helicopter. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah. sweet. A Mars helicopter. Wow. Mars helicopter. Yeah, like, it's a, like a drone, like a, like a drone, drone thing, right? Yeah. yeah. So sweet. A full-sized regular yes, helicopter? Yes, a full-sized regular <laughs> helicopter with people. <laughs> No, it's not. No, that's challenging it's because not. Earth, uh, Mars' atmosphere is, you know, less than a percent uh, the uh, yeah as the dense density. as Earth's atmosphere. So, that's that's a challenge. You have to have big. <laughs> right. So, this is a little tiny guy, 1.8 kilograms, so okay. uh, four pounds or so. And it's, um, the, yeah, you said the atmospheric pressure of Mars at the surface of Mars is like 100,000 feet altitude, three times the altitude of Everest. Uh, on the Earth. So, very, very thin air, much, much thinner than any actual terrestrial helicopters ever flown in. Um, so, it spins its little blades really, really fast, 3,000 uh. revolutions per minute, which is much faster than like a normal person carrying helicopter on the Earth does. But, they, you know, they've tested it. You can put this thing in a big chamber and pump the air pressure down to what the Martian air pressure is. Right. And sure enough, it flies around. Nice. So, this right. rover is going to be strapped to the bottom of the rover. This goes to Mars. The rover's going to drive around till they get it to a place where they say, okay, this is safe. And they'll, you know, then drop it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll pop off the bottom of the rover. <laughs> the rover will drive over and then the helicopter will take off. And it's just going to be doing, it's a tech demo thing. So, it has a camera. So that'll be kind of there'll be kind of a gee whiz factor. It's kind of right. fun, but it's not a real science investigation. Right. And its flights are going to be very limited, right? Because it's got to be battery powered, right. and you have to be able to charge those batteries by solar panels. And so it's got tiny little things. So I think they're talking about the a longest flight of like ninety seconds. Okay. The first flight just going to be go up thirty feet. Right. And go back down. So this is proof of concept. Proof so of concept. That's cool, yeah. Though. So that's pretty cool. Um, Anyway, it may feel like it's been a full solar sunspot cycle, but it's just been another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. <laughs> Thanks again to Adam LeMay for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Be sure to like us on Facebook to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com where you can also see some of our past sponsors and soon we'll be able to make donations and pick up some sweet WTG swag nice. like t-shirts. And Hey, Adam, what's that you've got there? Uh, it's a Walk About the Galaxy newly designed sticker. Awesome. awesome. Boy, that looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. Where you can ask us questions and suggest topics that you'd like to hear us discuss. Our theme music was composed by Richard Drusick. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And write us a review in invisible ink on the back of the U.S. Constitution and the National Archives. Or wait, there's already a review there. How did that happen? We'll have to ask Nick Cage. <laughs> I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Jim Cooney. And I'm Zoe Landsman. We're the Astrocork signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. 